What's up, hobby friends? And welcome to my three-part video tutorial series on how to paint Colossus from Marvel Crisis Protocol. This first video covers the assembly and preparation of the miniature, including any gap filling we have to do, as well as a slight modification to the arm and hand holding the sentinel hand. We end up rotating it a little bit to free up the angle and make the face and upper torso more visible, especially from the tabletop. We'll also cover painting the base khaki and terracotta stone, as well as doing the free hand for the sidewalk pathway, and then painting the sentinel head debris. Hey. To prime the Colossus miniature using Vallejo Surface Primer Black. To paint the khaki stones on the base, use AK Graphite, scale color star brown, Mojave white, and white sands. And to paint the terracotta stone on the sidewalk as well as the walkway markings, use scale color Indian shadow, Kalahari orange, and basic flesh. To paint the purple sentinel head armor, use AK amethyst blue, scale color sunset purple, AK deep purple, and then to paint the blue armor on the sentinel arm, using AK dark sea blue, white Prussian blue, aquatic turquoise, and scale colors pale skin. To paint the non metal model on the sentinel head and arm, we're using AK's dark sea blue, gray blue, spectrum blue, and greenish white. So I want to briefly talk about the assembly and preparation of our Colossus model. The model himself builds pretty easily. There's not a lot of parts to him and they hide the seams pretty well. Um, the back piece joins where the armor plating meets the cloth as well as the belt, so it's very easy to hide the seams on the side here. However, because there are front halves, we're going to have to gap fill the top, especially on the shoulders and on the right deltoid. But we'll get to that in a minute. Um, I want to talk briefly about the hand and the sentinel arm position. So the model, when you build it stock, he's got this weird overhang where the sentinel hand actually covers a lot of the face. So when you've got the model on the tabletop, I'm not a huge fan of this because top down, what you're seeing is this. And what we wanna do is we wanna angle the head and the hand so that they're facing like this. And this is a pretty easy fix. What we're gonna do is we're gonna cut off this little tab right here on the arm. We're gonna use that and we're gonna glue that into the hand, although you can skip that step and just green stuff fill this. What we want is a flat surface on both sides and then we can just glue the arm in a turned position. So I'm gonna use my hobby knife. I'm gonna cut that off. And just trim this part flat. And then we take the tab and then we just drop it in with a bit of super glue and that should level that out. But again, if you don't want to do this or if you want to just use some uh, green stuff or brown stuff or whatever sculpting material you have on hand, you can fill that. You would just have to plan ahead and um, fill that gap in probably overnight, let it fully cure. And then we're going to dry fit this and just uh, verify that we can get the hand on there nice and flush see if there's any additional sanding or carving we have to do to make sure we have a flush fit. And once we're happy with the fit, we'll just glue the two pieces together. And that's all we need to do. And you can see that it makes a huge world of difference. Um, the way he's holding it now, we definitely get a, a sense of sort of that dynamicism of the pose, very hero um, vanquishing his, his enemy sort of thing. And 
we can see clearly all the details on his face and torso. I'm also going to be keeping this model separate from the base, mainly because I want to be able to paint sort of the walkways and, and road markings very easily. We can do it with the model on there. He doesn't really obscure a lot of the detail, but um, having him off the base will make it easier just to work very quickly on the base. And then especially as well, when I'm recording this on camera, it makes it easy for me to record. So to do the gap filling on this model, we're going to be using Vallejo plastic putty. It comes in this neat little injector uh, tubing applicator. It makes it nice and easy just to apply a line. And then using a brush, we can just um, push the putty into the gap. I find that this putty isn't really good for larger gaps. So if you're having issues with um, gap filling sort of wider pieces or uh, pieces where the gap is fairly significant, you might want to use something like a uh, milliput. Um, when it's wet, milliput is very much like a clay, push it in very easily, and then it sands almost like plastic or a uh, um, resin once it's fully cured, and it cures pretty quickly. I find that the plastic putty really only works for small hairline gaps. You're also going to want to make sure that you apply this um, fairly heavily and use a brush with some water to smooth it out. It is an acrylic product, so you can dilute it. Um, and it's very easy to work with. And depending on the gap and how well that you've filled it in the first uh, pass, you may have to do several coats to really hide the seams. This does cure fairly quickly um, within minutes. So you can very quickly um, fill the gap, set it aside to dry real quick, and then um, go back for a second or third pass. And I like to do this gap filling on multiple models at once. This way I can sort of assembly line gap filling. And by the time I've finished gap filling uh, the last one and say a group of five or six, I can go back to the first one and do a second pass. So I'll go ahead and set this model to, to dry for maybe an hour, let the super glue fully cure, and make sure that um, the gap is nice and filled. I'll probably go ahead and get some light sandpaper. I'll sand this down, double check it, and then maybe do another pass or two. And then we're gonna prime the model with Vallejo Surface Primer Black. We'll prime the base as well as Colossus, and then we'll come back to work on the base. So we're gonna be working on our Colossus model from the base up. So we're gonna do the khaki stone and the terracotta for the sidewalk curb, we're gonna paint some uh, walkway markings, and then we're gonna paint the sentinel head. We'll apply a base coat onto the feet and then attach the model before proceeding to paint the rest of Colossus. I'm gonna be painting the khaki stone and terracotta stone in my typical um, Marvel collection color scheme. So if you've seen my previous videos for um, Doctor Strange and Baron Mortal, you're gonna know exactly how this will turn out. Also cover the basics on this one, mainly because I haven't covered painting um, the freehand, specifically the walkway markings on one of these bases before. And I thought it'd be a good opportunity on this model to go through that process. So the colors we're gonna be using um, for the khaki stone, AK graphite, scale colors, star brown, Mojave white, and white sands. The majority of the base is going to be up to the Mojave white highlighting, but the white sands, which is just a touch brighter, I'll focus on the rubble. I'm using an old brush for this, mainly so I don't have to worry about preserving the tip. And I'm just going to quickly apply a base coat of graphite over the entire um, khaki stone area. Make sure you get the paint into the cracks. Once the graphite is dry and before we proceed to painting the texture on the base, we want to apply a bit of black lining to the dividers and cracks in the stone. So I'm using a bit of 
Null Oil from Games Workshop, and I'm just going to paint this in. I'll do two or three passes to make sure it's got a nice even coat. You can use a little black paint for this. Uh, you can use an oil wash, entirely up to you. I like the Null Oil because it's nice and easy. It's no muss, very easy to clean up. And doing this at this stage now means that once we go back in with our highlighting, we can paint right up to the edge and clean up our um, non-oil washing mess, so to speak. Once the wash is dry in the cracks, we can begin our highlighting and texturing of the khaki stone. So the first thing we can do is make sure that we have our um, direction of light source established. So with Colossus on the base and using the Sentinel head as a reference, I know that this triangular stone is going to be the front of the base. And so as I'm building my texture and applying my highlights, this part of the base is going to be brighter and it's going to be darker on this part of the base. We're going to take our uh, Thar Brow and we're just going to go right into our first texture pass. Now, again, using an old brush for this, we don't want a sh super sharp tip. We want to be able to just quickly smash and um, mush the brush across the surface. We're going to start laying down this color. And as we do so, we're going to start to develop interesting patterns, interesting shapes, little clusters of color that we can then continue to build up and highlight to create that texture. Um, if you want, you can start to paint in uh, little cracks, um, lines of color or veins of color across the base as well. And we're going to do one or two passes of this color to build up to pure Thar Brown. From Thar Brown, we're going to keep working our way into Mojave White. And we do this just by mixing in progressive amounts of Mojave White to brighten up our highlight color. And you can see how just from the Thar Brown Pass, we already have some interesting shapes and patterns on the stone. And we want to keep reinforcing these by highlighting, um, bearing in mind where our light source is, so this being the front. We're going to start to highlight these little patches, little blocks of color. If we painted in any lines or cracks, highlight those accordingly. And just have fun with it. Really, the goal is to create interesting textures and interesting shapes on a relatively flat surface. And we're just going to keep working our way up into pure Mojave White. Now, as you work your way through the highlights and as you get brighter and brighter, Start to be a little more polished, a little bit more refined with your um, application of highlights. At some point, um, for accuracy, you may want to switch to a brush with a sharper tip. And don't forget to highlight the rubble around the sentinel head as well. to add a little bit of extra contrast and pop on the rubble. We're going to be using Scale Colors White Sands. It's just a, like an eggshell white. And we're going to focus on very bright highlights only on the rubble surrounding the sentinel head. And this way we add a little bit of extra um, elevation and sort of contrast without everything on the base looking too same scene. To paint the terracotta stone, we're going to be doing the exact same technique as the uh, khaki stone, but just using different colors. 
So I'm going to be using three colors for this. Scale colors, Indian Shadow, Kalahari Orange, and Basic Flush. We're going to work all the way up to, I would say, a 50-50 Kalahari Orange Basic Flush. And then maybe just a little bit of a brighter Basic Flush highlight on some of the edges. And these um, stone rivets or, or textures, whatever you want to call them. I don't know the name off the top of my head. We'll start with our base coat of Indian Shadow. And we'll do a couple of passes, making sure to be very neat where the terracotta stone meets the khaki stone on the edge here. The highlighting of the terracotta is, as I mentioned, very much the same as doing the khaki stone. Because of the curve of the sidewalk lip, you just want to be careful to apply highlights onto the inner curve here. And it is going to be just a touch darker on this corner or this uh, curve, but not really that much darker. And we're just going to highlight up and um, add that texture with our brush strokes. Once again, using this really old um, sort of ratty size two brush. When we get to these uh, rivets, I'm going to carefully use the side of my brush to highlight each one individually. And when I get to the inner uh, elements in between, the spaces in between each rivet, I'll try and be careful with the highlights. Um, some of the first few passes will get a little messy, but once I start to get brighter and brighter, I'll focus more on the rivets and less on the spaces around them. And that will help to create that separation in the detail between the two um, surface elements. And once we're at the Kalahari Orange, we can start mixing in some basic flesh. How bright you choose to go is up to you and sort of how um, bright or dark you want this terracotta stone to be. Just be careful not to go all the way to pure basic flesh on too large of an area. Otherwise, it will end up looking much like a flesh tone and not terracotta. Not as big a deal on a model like Colossus who has no flesh tones, so I'm not worried about any sort of clash of tones happening, but it's something to bear in mind. So painting the uh, markings for the pathway, it's fairly straightforward because all we're doing is we're painting a bunch of rectangles. But it can be tricky to, I guess, freehand straight lines, especially without using any sort of um, masking tape or whatever. A base like this, however, has a couple of reference lines that we can use as a jumping off point. So we have a horizontal here and a vertical here. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be using those two lines as our, our guiding points or as a point of reference to begin to um, mark out and freehand these walkway markings. So we're going to be taking our Indian Shadow and we're just going to make sure that it's nice and diluted. We want it to um, kind of be like a watercolor consistency. We're not looking to do an even base coat with this to begin with, but we want it to be nice and diluted so that we can very quickly and easily sketch in the, the lines that we need as our um, markings. So I'm going to pick an arbitrary point to determine the width of the pathway. So we're going to go somewhere along right here, just arbitrary, and then um, an arbitrary height for them, I guess. I'm going to pick a point right there. So from this gap on the sidewalk to right here, 
is going to be the width of my pattern. So I want to do another point about that width straight down. Call it there. And I'm using this vertical as a reference for the placement of these two dots. And I'll connect them. And that's the first of the uh, walkway markings. I'm going to do the same working my way down for the second one. So some distance approximate to this, right there. And I'll do the same thing for the actual second line. And I will connect the two. Now, it is trickier because we've glued on the sentinel head, so we can't match on the other side and then paint the verticals across. However, we can still just do the horizontal lines because I know um, the first two points of this line are gonna end up right underneath the rubble, and same with this one, it's gonna end up underneath. This point is gonna end up over here approximately somewhere. And I'm going to estimate the distance from this dot to here, mirrored on this side for the approximate position. And then it's a matter of connecting the dots horizontally. So if you didn't have this sentinel head in the way, you would do the exact same thing on the opposite side, doing your dots approximate in line and using this horizontal as a guide and I'm working way down as well. If you need help to figure out sort of how to space them, you can always paint the horizontals across as you work your way. Starting with the one closest to the uh, sculpted line on the base and working your way down. And you can see that because of our watercolor consistency, it's very easy to paint a very nice light line that works away across. You paint the vertical. And then we can start to fill in the lines. Now, I think because of the width of the lines from this angle, there's probably going to be the hint of a line on this side right here in this corner. And from here, it's just a matter of uh, filling in, getting a nice even base coat with this Indian shadow on these uh, walkway lines. And then we highlight them up in the exact same way as the sidewalk terracotta. It's important to remember to highlight these pathways in accordance with what we've painted on the khaki stone. You want your highlights and your shadows, your color patterns, um, any crack lines that you painted to carry across consistently. And that gives the impression that these um, terracotta lines are painted on top of the khaki. You don't want to have a wildly different highlighting um, structure on top. 
because then it makes it look like it's two separate elements that have been inset into one another, which may be what you want. If you're painting something like interlocking stone, then maybe it works to have um, the two different colors highlighted differently. Of course, bearing in mind that your light source is going to be consistent, but the texturing across both will be different. All right, so using our um, Kalahari Orange and Basic Flesh Mix, we're just gonna highlight these up to match the khaki stone. And once the walkway lines are highlighted, we can go back in with some of our uh, khaki stone colors. So our um, Mojave Earth and our Thar Brown. And we can just clean up any sort of edges and corners that may have sort of um, straight over paints or need some neatening up. And what we're also going to be doing at this stage is um, giving these uh, walkway lines a bit of wear. So I'm going to be using a uh, sponge and a pair of tweezers for this. And we're going to use a technique called sponge weathering. And what we're going to do is we're just going to dab this into um, our khaki stone colors and we're just going to dab this over some of the areas that might receive some wear, some scuff marks. Maybe a little bit more of the far brown in the back here because it's darker. And then maybe I'll go back in by hand and paint some deliberate larger dots a little bit more accurately. The, the sponge is nice for a very random pattern, but it's not very accurate. And so in some areas where I want to deliberately put in some of the stone color back, I'm going back in by hand. And this just makes the walkway feel uh, very worn, very used, and not uh, factory fresh. I think we'll see a lot of this wear on the edges of the concrete. So I think I'm going to add more here and here. Now we're going to be uh, painting the sentinel head before we attach Colossus and there's two elements of this. There's going to be a um, non-metal metal silver sort of um, circuitry and internal components part of it and then there is the purple armor. So we're going to start with the purple armor and I'm going to be using four colors for this. Uh, AK's amethyst blue, scale color sense of purple, AK deep purple, and scale color tenor yellow. So we're going to start with our amethyst blue and we're just going to apply a base coat over the entire uh, surface for wherever the purple armor is. And make sure not to overpaint onto the rubble. And make sure to paint along the inside as well. Once we have our base coat of amethyst blue, we're just going to highlight up through those four colors or three colors, sense of purple, deep purple, and then tenere yellow. Um, the sunset purple in the scale range, even though scale is mostly matte, I find that it's almost like a bit of a satin to it. And it's going to be a little weird to paint with, especially because the jump between amethyst blue and the sense of purple, it, it does 
lean more into red, but I really do like how this color does end up turning out. So um, stick with it. We're not really gonna do a lot of intermediary mixing um, in between amethyst blue and sunset purple. We're just gonna use sort of like a natural dilution from water on the wet palette and then a feathering or glazing uh, application to smooth out those colors. When you get to some of the sides of the head, or I guess the top forehead, sorry, there are very subtle armor plates that you're gonna to want to leave in that amethyst blue base coat. Just be careful when you're painting to leave those armor plates um, in that base color. And now it's time to really start highlighting the sentinel head. The sunset purple forms sort of the base tone of the actual purple armor. And to start highlighting, we're gonna mix in some progressive amounts of deep purple. We don't wanna go into deep purple right off the bat. We sort of wanna start with, um, let's call it a 50-50 mix. Start to block in where our real highlight is coming in from. And what we're gonna do is, as we highlight up, we're gonna to start to get really scratchy with our highlights. All the way up into deep purple, and the idea is to simulate sort of wear and tear, um, scratches and surface details. Because this isn't a factory for Sentinel, he's destroyed, and we want to get that effect happening with our highlight. We don't wanna just do paint um, straight edge highlights. And then from deep purple, we're gonna mix in just a touch of Tenere yellow. You don't need too much, otherwise it ends up being a little too um, too pink and too, uh, too bright. But I would say like a 70-30 mix of deep purple Tenere yellow. And we're gonna focus this highlight on um, the sharpest corners. And then with this, we can also highlight some of these scratches adding a few dots and uh, lines across the general surface and help to simulate some body damage. And we're gonna repeat that over all of the armor plates. Um, when we get to these forehead panels, we can really help to accentuate the panel lining by highlighting each of these edges along the edge there. So take your time and um, just really pay attention to those details. Um, don't move too quickly. It's much easier to be neat now and not have to worry about correcting too much. Now, that being said, if you do go over those lines, um, or armor paneling lines and need to correct, you can always go back in with your amethyst blue afterwards and just uh, gently paint those in as well. There are a couple of metallic elements on the sentinel head that have to be painted. We're looking at eyes, some vents and grills and stuff, and we're just gonna do them very simply. We're using four colors, aka dark sea blue, gray blue, spectrum blue, and greenish white. And we're just gonna highlight through the four colors we're not really painting large 
flat surface areas. So just in terms of blending the colors together, all we're going to be doing is just some quick layering in combination with a diluted mix. And that should allow us to um, quickly blend up the colors. Someone's going straight into each color in progression. from gray blue into spectrum blue. As we highlight up, we can just highlight less and less of the object and give the impression of a reflective highlight. And then we'll finish off with some greenish white, some really sharp highlights. What I want to do before I attach Colossus to the base, just to make it easier on myself, especially when I get to the base coating on Colossus, and I'll have to worry about carefully painting um, into some of the deeper shadows where he attaches. I'm going to take AK's burnt red. This is going to be the base coat um, for the red. And I'm just going to apply a base coat to the areas that are uh, going to be touching the base or the sentinel head and where I don't want to have to try and get the brush in the deeper shadows. Now, when I actually get to the uh, painting of the red itself, we are going to mix some tenebrous gray um, into the burnt red for some deeper shadowing. So if you want, you can actually base coat with that as well. And then once that's dry, we're going to get some super glue. We're going to attach the model to the base. And then we're going to set that aside to dry for probably about an hour or so. Make sure that the super glue is fully set before actually getting back to painting our Colossus miniature. We don't want to have any wet glue there. Um, if an errant brush stroke happens to slip by, we're going to ruin our brush. Well, that's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed it, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe for more awesome weekly content. And don't forget to check out my other video series, both for this model, as well as others I've uploaded to my YouTube channel. As always, until next time, happy hobbying.